actually a tougher act to follow now after three awesome speakers. I've learned a lot. So um, uh, just uh, as a comment at the beginning, I'm actually a computer scientist by training, actually a machine learning uh, scientist by training, which makes me love to generalize. So if I generalize too much, um, I'm sorry if that annoys you, but um, as to rescue that a little bit, I inserted the word human in here because that's uh, all I'm going to talk about. So we've heard um, today nicely summarized that there are biological differences between males and females at various levels. So we know that gene content is different because of X and Y um, sex chromosome differences. And um, some of these um, are, in, are in networks with genes in the autosomes, and that result in epigenetic and gene expression differences. And even male cells and female cells are exposed to different environments, being it uh, biological or because of the environment, differences in environment between men and uh, females and based on society, societal factors. So on the other hand, we also know that there are uh, major sex biases in variety of psychiatric and neurological diseases. For example, a major depression that I'll come back to later, we know that it's more prevalent in females, two to one ratio, age of onset is earlier, and um, symptoms and even drug response to drugs could be different. So looking at um, kind of these sex biases and disease across different countries is a nice way to rule out artifacts and also try to try to get at the root cause, is it whether this is genetic or is it uh, environmental. So I found this um, figure from a review paper a few years ago, really interesting looking at um, sex preferences of various neurological diseases across uh, up to eight different countries and for example, you can see for multiple sclerosis, um, it's more prevalent in females, and the ratio is very consistent across these different countries, probably pointing to um, more likely genetic um, causes. We have similar observations for a variety of psychiatric diseases, including major depression, where we know that the, it's more prevalent in female, and that's pretty uh, consistent across different cultures and countries. So, now the question is that in the field of human geno genetics and genomics, we've had a lot of advances in being able to generate genome-wide omics data that allow us to do these genome-wide scans to try to associate um, genetic, epigenetic, transcriptomic mechanism to diseases. And this gives us a really good opportunity to try to figure out how can we use the biological differences that we've learned so much about to try to understand the disease-level differences uh, in humans. So in the talk that I'm going to focus on, where are we in, in this endeavor and how much have we learned? And maybe the one sentence summary would be that we have a lot more to do and a lot more uh, to learn in this area. So in order to tell you about um, analysis of sex-specific differences and how that relates to disease, I'm going to put it in the context of two scientific paradigms for um, trying to derive mechanisms from genomic data. So the major challenge in human studies is that we can't control the environment, obviously, and that results in confounding. So there are two ways, at least uh, from a statistical statistician point of view, two ways that we can design experiments to try to address this. One is um, what um, is referred to as systems genetics, where we start with genetic data to use as causal anchors and then work out the down, um, downstream mechanism of those genetic risk factors. And the other, um, I call this um, omics deconvolution, but maybe that's something that you don't think of it in those terms, but the idea is that we start from an intermediate molecular trait, like gene expression, trying to associate that with disease. And that's nice and powerful because it gives us both genetic and non-genetic factors and mechanisms eventually. But the challenge is that it also tells us a lot about confounding factors. So we have to figure out how to deconvolve the effect. And sometimes the solution has to be creative, um, analytical, and statistical uh, approach at looking at the data. So um, in terms of systems genetics, um, we start from the genome and do a scan to try to figure out what are the factors that are associated with the disease of interest, and then use other types of omics data in a secondary way, either to work out the downstream mechanisms or to uh, try to enhance those scans to be more biologically informed. So the first component would be doing a GWAS where we collect genotype, genotyping data across a large number of individuals and then scan across the genome. So in some sense, it's simple to do a GWAS because all we're doing is for each loci, we're relating it to a phenotype and we're doing that independently at each loci. And um, because of that, we can just sim ask a sim simple statistical question, which loci are correlated with uh, the genotype of interest? 
But um, the challenge is in the problem of false positive detections. And this is something that I'll come back to later and, and link to sex specificity and the challenges that we face there today. Um, so the challenge is in false positive detection because we just are simply measuring millions of variables, and we want to test millions of variables, but we don't have similarly large sample sizes. So even by random chance, if the data was completely random, we would see tons of correlations. Um, so there's a statistical brute force to this problem, which is we limit, we um, correct for number of tests that we've done, and that boils down to uh, setting a very stringent p-value threshold and calling something correlated or not. So, um, so in the last um, 10 years or so, since early 2000s, there's been hundreds to uh, almost thousands of GWASs uh, for various traits and diseases. And um, now we have a lot of really nice um, and reproducible genetic uh, risk loci for a variety of diseases that were really intractable before, and we didn't have insight to, at least from a causal mechanistic point of view, in, in human studies. So, for example, just this year, um, there was a GWAS on uh, major depression that resulted in 44 independent loci associated with major depression, and so on. So we have, we have now these great resources, uh, and all standardized and reported in um, catalogs like um, GWAS catalog that we can use and go and uh, investigate them further. But uh, one thing that uh, is important is it actually took 10 years for this approach to work. And the reason why it took 10 years for it to work is maybe obvious in hindsight. Um, so it turns out complex disease is a lot more complex than we once thought, or at least before the GWAS era. Now it's estimated that hundreds to thousands of loci could be associated with uh, any um, complex disease. And, um, and even more importantly, it turns out that the genetic risk profiles that patients can carry are heterogeneous. They're very different from each other. And that uh, was really nicely summarized by this perspective piece by uh, Naomi Ray and Sal earlier this year, and summarized by this figure, which I won't go through. But the idea is that if you look at uh, um, patients that have, on average, similar level of genetic disease burden, they actually have different composition of those um, risk uh, factors. So disease, uh, complex diseases, and this was um, for schizophrenia, is much more complex than um, kind of we appreciated before. Um, so in order for GWAS to be successful, actually what had to happen was um, large consortium had to be formed, and people had to really openly share their data um, in, a, in a really open and transparent way. And on top of that, statisticians and computational scientists got involved really in a true way to create these um, very standardized pipelines for analyzing the data, bringing them together, and making inferences. But one of the challenges now is that we have these standardized pipelines that are too standardized and not nuanced enough to answer some more specific questions that I'll mention. So how does sex specificity come into this framework? Well, by three simple ways that we can start from. We can start looking at the sex chromosomes. As we've heard a lot, if there are some genetic risk factor on either X or uh, if it's on Y, we know that for sure it's going to have a sex-specific effect. But if it's on X, there's a good chance that it will also have a sex-specific effect. Um, we can also continue to search to look on the autosomes and do, for example, a stratified analysis to see if the effect sizes are different. And that would be, that would be caused by, for example, differences in regulatory networks or epigenomic structure that would make one loci um, be related to disease in one sex and not and the other sex. But eventually, to actually prove statistically that there is a sex-specific effect or sex difference, what we need to do is some sort of interaction test where we compare effect sizes and say, are they statistically different or not? And what I'll come back to is this is actually a very high bar to pass, and we might not be there in terms of the data that we have and importance that we have to pass this bar, and we shouldn't be discouraged too early if um, interaction tests are actually not becoming not coming out significant. So uh, early in 2003, let's see how we're doing in terms of uh, these three simple steps that can be done. So early in uh, 2013, there was a review paper that really highlighted that X chromosome is actually not really being analyzed in any of these GWAS studies, and I'll show you the evidence for that on the next slide. But um, this really brought the attention on this topic that we shouldn't be ignoring just sex chromosomes um, otherwise, we're not really doing genome-wide scans. <laughs> we shouldn't be calling it genome-wide scans if we're not actually looking at a large portion of the genome. 
So the reason why uh, it wasn't really analyzed, so neither X nor Y chromosome was really analyzed in um, most of the GWAS studies before 2013, um, there was three reasons that were typically reported. Sample size is too small to do stratified analysis, which is actually not, not an issue. I'll, I'll mention that why. Um, then dealing with technical issues, that, that was probably the major part of it, that analyzing data from X and Y chromosome has nuances. And um, if you don't do it correctly, there will be a lot of spurious association. So this was probably the major part. But I think maybe the, the also a big part was that people had this idea that, well, sex chromosomes are small. We shouldn't really look at them. There's not that much there. Um, so we, we don't really have to bother. And that's probably like a cultural factor and, and, and ignorance on the part of um, people that are doing the analysis not being informed by the biology and the animal world. So, um, so in 2015, um, after this issue was brought into light, uh, there were papers like this, XWAS, that developed software for analyzing X chromosomes specifically, and things try to uh, start to improve. So the issues uh, for the X chromosome are that because the, there's copy number differences, if you need to call your genotypes separately for males and females, and you need to do imputations separately for males and females. And if you don't do this, you will see systematic differences in genotype calls that results in a lot of false positives. And, and that's the one thing that the community wants to avoid. So for that reason, they, they weren't really um, addressing it. But once software like this came along, then things started to improve. So this is um, a nice table from the review paper that I mentioned that really highlights this um, phenomena that X and Y are not being analyzed. Uh, what you can see is the number of loci that are found in any GWAS for each of the first 22 chromosomes and then for X and Y. So one observation is that the number of loci that are found per chromosome tend to correlate with the length of the chromosome, which supports this idea that disease is very polygenic, so there could be risk loci um, everywhere. But if you look at X and Y before, uh, uh, up to 2013, we had barely any finding for X and nothing for Y, which is clearly not what would we expect if you believe this model that the, the number of findings should be proportional to the chromosome length. So I looked up what we have now in GWAS Central as of 2016, and as of last week, you can see things are a little bit better for X chromosome, but not for Y chromosome. So that's, that's a very understudied um, area that people haven't really analyzed these GWAS studies to look at association between any loci on Y chromosome and uh, any traits or diseases in human studies. So, um, so, but to go one step further and to statistically prove that there is a sex-specific effect in these kind of study, as I mentioned, we need to pass the statistical bar of significance between effect sizes. There have been a number of studies in the last five or six years looking at interaction tests specifically, and I would say majority of them had negative results in that they didn't really find um, statistically significant loci that effect sizes were different between males and females. There are a couple of ex exceptions that are well cited, um, one including the Relin, uh, a SNP in the Relin loci that's associated with schizophrenia in, in male and females and not in males. But what I want to say here is that it's, it's, um, it's not true that there are not like, sex-specific differences. These analyses um, are underpowered, as I'll show you, and we can't yet conclude that there are no sex-specific differences between um, this interaction test. So it's true that in the current data that we have with the current approach, we can't find them, but there's signal buried behind the noise. So the one line of evidence for that is, um, for example, illustrated in this plot, if you take all the autoimmune um, risk loci reported in GWAS catalog and look at the effect size for those risk loci in terms of impact on gene expression, so through an EQTL study in males and females separately, you'll see that a large portion of the risk loci have differences on effect size on gene expression between males and females. So that's telling you that there are probably loci that would have sex-specific effect and difference in, in effect size buried behind the noise, but we're just doing too many tests and we don't have the statistical power to weed out um, false positives and true positives. So, um, so here, we need to continuously look at this question and not give up too easily. Here's another um, line of evidence that says we don't have the 
statistical power to actually answer this question with our current approaches. So if you look at the number of um, significant hits that we can identify for these three, uh, for Heights, schizophrenia, and Crohn's disease, as, the, as a function of number of cases that have been used in this study, you will see two obvious trends. One is that we're nowhere near saturating in terms of our finding. And the second is that if we were to actually um, cut the sample size in half to compare effect sizes in males and females, you would lose half of our finding, which would imply that we actually don't have enough samples to accurately estimate effect sizes in both males and females, which would be needed for us to say that those are different. So again, the signal buried behind the noise, and we need to find better ways of bringing it out. So, um, so the, the, on the conclusion of uh, this part of the talk, I uh, just wanted to say that um, there, we know that there should be sex-specific stuff, or at least we know that there, it should be investigated more thoroughly, and we shouldn't be too quick to say that there are no sex-specific effects, which I, I see that is kind of happening in the literature. So we know that there, there, we're lacking statistical power, and this should be in the place in the context of what we know about the data. And, but meanwhile, um, as, as suggested by uh, Matthew Powers and, and this commentary, what should be done is at least reporting the results for, uh, for stratified analysis for males and females so that the, the results can be reanalyzed later to try to weed out um, true positives from the um, noise of association, the, the bunch of associations that were done. Um, in the second part of the talk, I'll tell you about a specific project on major depression to try to highlight specifically um, the importance uh, and relevance of looking at sex-specific effects. So as I mentioned, um, with the genetic approach, we're kind of going at it from just to try to find the genetic risk factors, but we can also start from intermediate molecular traits like gene expression and try to find the mechanism for disease through, through those intermediate molecular traits. Um, here, the power is that we, the, they get us both um, genetic risk factors because they're downstream, and potentially even environmental risk factors will be reflected in intermediate molecular traits. Um, and also because um, something like gene expression is closer to the end phenotype, we expect to see larger effect sizes. But on the other hand, the challenge comes in the fact that also the disease consequence are reflected in, in transcriptome or anything that's downstream of the of the genome, and also confounding environmental factors are reflected. So we need to figure out how to account for these. So as a way of background, um, we know that uh, major depression, or MDD as I'll call it, has a substantial genetic heritability. And so from twin studies, we know um, heritability is between 30 to 40 percent. But up until very recently, um, none of the GWASs had um, resulted in any significant findings for MDD, so we had really little clue of uh, from a mechanistic point of view. This motivated a transcriptomic study to try to understand the mechanisms a little bit better. Um, so this is the, the project that started during my uh, postdoc when I was at Stanford, um, working with Doug Levinson and many other. We uh, collected gene expression data for about 1,000 individuals, um, in a case control setting. So at the time, this was the largest gene expression data set for um, MDD, and still it's one of the largest. Uh, and I, I would say the nicest thing about this study was that the individuals in the study were really, um, um, went un went underwent interviews uh, many hours, and we had a lot of clinical, medical, medication information, demographical information for these individuals, so we can look at the effect of these variables on this study. And, um, lastly, the gene expression data was from blood because we wanted the large sample sizes to actually be able to, to say something statistical, and so we had to resort to blood. But I will say, um, even though blood might not reflect all brain-specific mechanisms, it turned out that there are some nice alignments depending on how you represent and summarize the data. So the first uh, thing that we did was to look at the types of variables that we have, their effect on gene expression, what variables do we see correlated with gene expression? And as we expected, we saw that a lot of different demographical and medica medical information actually correlate with gene expression levels. So you can see here are the number of genes whose expression are, are statistically correlated with any of these variables. And you see for, for some variables, like 
sex and age and smoking, there are a lot of genes whose expression correlate. Here I should mention that sex, I don't know what to call it here, because it's also correlated with a bunch of other variables, so it's probably more of a gender, it's not just um, sex variable. So one development in the field of statistical genomics over the last two or three years has been this idea of modeling hidden confounding factors. So the idea is that we can never measure all possible confounding factors, and there could be some that are just, we just didn't measure them, we didn't thought of, think about them, and some that we didn't measure accurately enough because we use questionnaire data. So um, the concept is that if we do, if we take, let's say, gene expression data, do a dimensionality reduction, like principal component analysis, and find the principal components of the data that captures most of the variants, oftentimes we see that those principal components correlate with either technical factors or demographical information. So uh, the idea hidden confounding factor correction is that if there is some large-scale variability in the data that we don't attribute, attribute to known or measured confounding factors, maybe we can attribute it to unmeasured confounding factors and we should adjust for them. And I would say the field has been um, really pushing on this idea that we should figure out what these hidden confounding factors are and, and adjust for them in association analysis. So in our approach, um, coming from the GWAS world, um, we were very cautious in terms of what we accounted for when we looked at correlation with major depression. So um, we corrected for a large number of demographical variables and medication intake, about 30 of them. And in addition, we corrected for a large number of um, hidden covariates. And then we asked two questions. Are there any genes that are associated with MDD, any single genes, after we control for these variables? And then we asked a higher level question that if we look at the data at pathway level, not just single genes, do we find any associations? So we, we found this uh, one, no single gene was significant. Um, and maybe that's not surprising given the complexity of the disease, but we found one pathway that was interesting. Um, so it's the interferon signaling pathway that uh, we saw an elevated expression uh, um, in MDD patients, but not uh, in the controls. And this was interesting to us, and we wanted to follow up on this um, because of the MS literature um, suggesting that multiple sclerosis patients that take interferons are more susceptible to clinical depression. So um, our initial analysis, we looked at sex specificity in, in this data a little bit by looking to see if the effect sizes for these pathways are different in males and females. And there was a bit of um, suggestive uh, data looking like um, for males, it was a little bit more skewed, but we couldn't really statistically prove it yet. Um, the one observation we had was that if we account for, depending on how we account for hidden confounding factor, whether to be inferred them from joint data or from stratified data, um, the results would change. And so this gave us the sense that it's unstable to include hidden confounding factor when, when we ask this question. Okay, <laughs> not used to it. Um, so, so, so we kind of left the story here until two new data sets came along that really changed the way we looked at this um, data. So the first study was, um, I'll call it NESTA, which is gene expression data from about 1,800 individuals from blood. Uh, it was a study from Netherlands that had a very similar design to the, our, our study, which I'll call DGN. And the second study, um, La Bonte et al. in Nature Medicine, um, looking at gene expression data in brain um, from about um, 20 people, but they, or sorry, 40 people, but they had gene expression from six different brain regions for all of these individuals. So initially, we were trying to replicate our result in um, this Janssen, in Janssen et al. study, um, Nesta study, and we were unsuccessful, but then the La Bonte study gave us some clue. So what the Labonte study had, had seen was that if you um, stratify by sex and then look at each brain region, find genes that are associated with MDD in each brain region, males seem to be con more consistent with each other in terms of what gene sets are coming up, and there was more heterogeneity in terms of the gene sets that were coming up uh, in female across different brain regions. So that's summarized by 
these um, visualizations that are nice, but uh, kind of hard to parse, so I won't go through the details. But so this motivated us to really look at this question of stratified by sex in our um, DGN study to see, after we do this, do we see better replication and overlap with these other larger studies? Um, so in order to do this, um, the work that was really driven by uh, Maria Chikina at University of Pittsburgh, she developed a new approach for um, doing estimating hidden variables jointly from multiple data sets that really addressed the problem that I mentioned, the instability problem that um, we had initially. And once uh, she had that approach, then she looked at stratified analysis by sex um, to see if the DGN and NESTA study, for example, correlate better um, after this, uh, after stratification. So I'll quickly go over the plots. Um, so each, uh, each dot here is a pathway. On the x-axis, you have the t-statistics, which is kind of a sign effect size in the DGN study. And on the y-axis, you have um, the t-statistics for the NESTA study. So the summary was that it seems like for male, um, if you looked at male only, there were two pathways that would come up in both studies. Um, and the, the results kind of became much more diluted if you looked at male, uh, females and if you included the whole population. So this was subtle but statistically significant. And when we actually do the, did the same analysis for overlapping brain and blood, we saw even a more um, stronger effect that um, the males tend to correlate with each other better in terms of what gene sets and pathways are coming up, but not so much um, females. So this really highlighted that um, in our investigation, we should have stratified by sex early, but then um, infer these hidden variables jointly on the whole population, because it's hard to infer hidden variables on one population at a time. So um, to summarize, basically what we saw is that um, but, but the, with this data, it seems like the gene sets that are associated with depression in males tend to be more homogeneous than, than with females. It's either a genetic cause or an environmental cause. It could be that the, the females are exposed to different environmental factors from each other, and that causes heterogeneity. Or it could be at the genetic level that I mentioned. So with that, um, I'll summarize. Um, so... Uh, what I want to emphasize is that the types of data that we're generating are as complex, as rich as the diseases that we're trying to investigate. And we really need better methods to exploit this data to give, give us the, the complex biology that we're looking for. And there's lots of opportunities in reanalyzing existing data and with a sex-specific view and angle to it. And I think having meetings like this where we can be informed of the known biology and then use that to reanalyze some of these existing data give us really good opportunities. Um, so with that, uh, thank you so much for your attention. And thanks again so much for the invitation. I've learned a lot by being here. And I want to thank um, people that were involved, um, everyone in the GGN study, especially uh, Doug Levinson and Maria Chikina, uh, who did um, all the replication work that I mentioned. Thanks so much.